This is your city. This is your city wants to know. We want to know the background, the heartbeat of what makes up our beautiful cities. We dig into the backstories from the struggles to the successes of our local entrepreneurs, small business owners, artists, not for profit organizations, and the many, many people who make up the intricate tapestry of our communities. Real people, real stories, by you and for you. But wait, that's not it. I love giving my opinion. Just ask anyone who knows me. We can't get enough of the honest, gritty feedback of places that we spend our hard earned money. I'll give you the good, the bad, and the ugly of the places I eat, sleep, and visit. Disclaimer my opinion, my opinion only. All right, so come on, let's get to it. Good evening, everyone, and welcome back to another episode of This Is Your City. I am Kim, your host. Now, something you guys might not know about me is that I love musicals. I love Broadway. And one of my dreams in life, like I have been blessed to travel many places around the world, but one of my dreams has always to see a musical on Broadway. And I've never had the opportunity yet but I will. I will. I know I will. And my guest today, her name is Geraldine Anello. Well, she made it happen. She had dreams and visions and goals, and she made it happen. She's a musician. She's either a conductor, a pianist, a music director. But the most exciting thing is that most often she can be found in the Broadway orchestra. And to me, that's so exciting being that I love Broadway so much. And she's worked on so many things like on Broadway, things we've heard about. You might not have seen some of the shows, but we've definitely heard of them like Kinky Boots and School of Rock, Matilda, The Share Show, just to name a few. Off Broadway, she's done things like Children of Salt, Trip of Love, and something that really excites me again, whether you've seen it or not, most definitely you've heard of Mamma Mia, The Grinch Who Stole Christmas, Chick Flick Musical. She has been a part of all of those and that excites me. So Geraldine, welcome to This Is Your City. Thank you so much for joining us. How are you today? Hi, I'm so good. I'm so excited to be uh, here. So excited to be here with you. Me too. I'm so excited. Like you heard me just say, I have loved Broadway. I love musicals. And I've been blessed to see like some musicals, but not on Broadway. But yeah. <laughs> musicals are fun. Musicals are super fun. And there's a lot of really high level musicals anywhere outside of New York City. So it's not just New York City. You know, Broadway shows tour. So if yes. you go see a national show, you're seeing the Broadway version on tour is what it is, you know? True, true. I, sh I guess I should have like... In New York City is where I've always wanted to see a Broadway show. I should, I should have said that. But yeah, yes, I haven't been able to yet, but I will. But Geraldine, what I want to start off with, and I'm so happy you're here to talk about some of this stuff with us, but Woo. we're going to get into what you're doing now, things, you know, some of the projects you're on or doing. But before we do that, one of the reasons I find it really important to talk about some of things here is because success does not come without it's obstacles. It does not come without challenges and sacrifice. And we have to scale those sometimes. Sometimes we have to find our way around it. And that's a huge block for a lot of people. When those obstacles come, they either maybe fear. I don't know what it is. Sometimes they just become stagnant or give up. But you are not a stranger to obstacles and sacrifice and just things in your life that came up that could have tripped you up, but you didn't let it. So if you don't mind, you want to, can we start with that? We'll start with a little bit about your, you personally, start way back when, and we'll start off with that if that's okay with you. Let's do it. Let's do it. All right. So you're a musician. First and Ooh. foremost, like you're an artist. It's part of your breath. So yeah. Take us back a little bit. When did all of this start? 
Yeah, uh, my mom took piano lessons. So there was a piano at home. And I think just as a little tot, like four year old, I think I was playing on it. And they were like, well, I guess she's interested in it. They took me to a piano lesson and that's all I wanted to do. Like, I remember I went to the conservatory to try to test into the conservatory because it starts very young in France where I'm from. And there was this form and my mom was like, well, on the form, you have to answer three, like two other instruments you'd like to do if you're not accepted in piano. And I was like, well, why? Like, I'm going to be accepted in piano. I don't understand. And she's like, well, that's fine. Just take two. And so I was like, fine, I guess we'll put guitar and harp, which in hindsight, and I only realized this a few years ago, actually said a lot about my musical interests because all those three instruments have something in common, which is harmony. You can play multiple notes together at the same time. I did not say piano, violin, and trumpet, you know, <laughs> that played single lines. I really wanted the harmony of it. So that's interesting. But anyways, I came in, did the test as, you know, maybe what, a five, five-year-old or something. And I left the test and I was like, I'm not going to do the other instruments. And I genuinely came out and told my mom, if I'm not taking in piano, I'm just not doing the other ones because I'm going to be accepted in piano anyway. So <laughs> so much sass at a five-year-old. But that was it. It was piano or nothing. And that was that. <laughs> I love that determination. I'm going to get in playing piano. Like you've already knew it, like in your in yourself, you knew I'm going to yeah. do it. I don't need to yeah. waste any more time. Just get me in already. <laughs> yeah, and let's be clear, I love the guitar and the harp and the violin and the trumpet. It, they were just not the instrument I was meant to play. I was meant right. to enjoy the people that are good at those play those is what I was meant to do with those instruments or uh, date guitarists, but that's another topic. That's awesome. <laughs> so that you started at three? Four, I think. Four. And then I think somewhere I, I read that you started teaching at age 15. Yeah, <laughs> I didn't really want to. My mom was kind of like, you should. And I don't remember if I said I wanted to maybe babysit because I wanted to make money. And that's when she said, no, you should teach instead. I don't remember the order of things. All I know is she, it never occurred to me I, I would. And my mom was like, of course, that's what you should do. And so I immediately made more money than I would have if I were babysitting. But I was 15. My first student was the waffle man in my hometown. There was this guy with a waffle truck and he was a hit with the teenagers, you know. And uh, so I used to go there a lot. And I said, I'm teaching piano. I think he must have mentioned it or he knew I was playing piano. And he was like, well, will you teach me? And he was my first student. He must have been in his 50s. <laughs> and it was so awkward because in piano, at first you have to teach the, the, you know, the hand position and things like that. And so you make physical contact. And so as a 15 year old girl, having to touch a grown man's hands was not exactly the position that I felt most uh, at peace with, but uh, that that's where it started. That, did you get free waffles? Oh, <gasps> no. <laughs> no. What? Maybe one. We're good. Listen, since I don't remember, we're going to say I did get one. No, but he, I mean, he paid me, right? I was yeah, paid. yeah. Yeah. But, well, that's awesome. My favorite waffle was, it was this strawberry and whipped cream, strawberry mm. jam and whipped cream. And like, I've never found this anywhere else, but that's where it was at. The, the truck is no longer around. I don't know where the truck went, but, but the that's, memory of the waffle lingers on. That it lives <laughs> on. That's awesome. Now you have an accent. So what? <laughs> <laughs> As soon as I heard you, I knew, um, because I saw a video of you, I knew you were French. So, you know, I don't know if that's true because people like I've, I meet a lot of people all the time. I tend to meet like dozens and dozens of people every week and I have for many years. And so I really hear a lot of different opinions on this. Some well, people right away are like, are like, you're French and many, many others are like, where are you from? And if I will not give them the answer they will go through a list of 15 or 20 countries before they go to France. So I don't know if quite as obvious as people think it is when they already know the answer, oddly enough. But I didn't know the answer right away. Ah, so you're one of the good ones. Maybe I did. <laughs> I don't think I knew right away. But the thing is, I, it. <laughs> yeah, I know. I'm French. So ah. I, but I, I'm Acadian French, which is really, really a bad excuse for a language. But so I, it's, yeah, your French is beautiful and eloquent, and, and my French is like half French, half English. It's like, you know, redneck French. <laughs> it's redneck French. That's funny. <laughs> so I, I kind of, I think I figured out that you were French just because I come from French. So, yeah. I mean, listen, my mother is an 18th century French literature specialist and researcher. So mm -hmm. as far as she's concerned, my French is never 
at the right level. And since I've spoken English, which now has been for many years, my French has really taken a nosedive. So really, uh, my, my, my mother would not say my French is eloquent by any shape of the imagination. <laughs> That's stretch funny. of the imagination. <laughs> so you're born in France? I was born in mainland France and I grew up on a French island off the coast of South Africa. And then I moved back to mainland France for my teenage years. So very much my childhood up to 18 was split. It was half on the, in the o o Indian Ocean near Africa and half in mainland France. Oh, that's wonderful. What a good experience. Yeah, I mean, it's very different, right? Because when you, uh, it was 11, I was 11 years old when I moved back to mainland France. Nobody thought of telling me there was going to be a culture shock. I didn't even know the words culture shock. And everybody figured, well, it's French. So we're in France, we're going to France. But culturally, it's a whole other thing. And, you know, it was a melting pot, which my hometown in France was not. So that was a big shock. Coming back, I remember like my first day at school being like, why is, it, why is everybody white? That was really <laughs> jarring. Like, I, I was like, where did everybody go? Where are the people? Like, where did they all, where are they all? So that was pretty jarring. And I, the, the whole mentality was different. People were not smiling as much. They were not quite as friendly. And France is very much more of a reserved, um, at first approach kind of culture. So that was all very different. And then the weather and everything. But yeah, nobody told me. So it, I basically had culture shock for a year and having to deal with it by myself for a year. And, and then now I'm really good at culture shock because I basically live with it constantly. But... <laughs> Yeah. Well, that that's another that's a good segue in a sense. So, born in France, half your life off the coast of South Africa, back to France. Now you're in America. Uh, now I'm in well, yes, the American continent. Where are you? I'm in Mexico. Oh, you're in Mexico now, which is uh, considered the you know it's the American continent. Yeah, I'm in. Well, Mexico. it's North America. It's not. You yeah. can tell I'm in Mexico by this beautiful uh, macrame that I had I love made. It. Yes. No, I love Especially it. Specially made. But they don't always come in these big sizes and in this ochre color. So there you go. <laughs> <laughs> I, I knew you. I thought you went to Mexico and then came back. Okay, so you're in Mexico now. Wow, you're well yeah. traveled. But let's back up a little bit. So French, you had a, sh you had culture shock. You speak oui. the language though, same language at least. Maybe kind of. I mean, you know, in the, in the island, they spoke Creole. Oh, really? So at school it was French, but in the world around, it was very much Creole. Like if I went to my reunion, is the name of the island is the Reunion Island. If I went to my friends who were born there, if I went to their house, their parents spoke Creole. So, you know, oh. you had to understand it and you had to, you know, get it. So yeah, it was same language, but also kind of not. Oh, it's not. I have friends who are Creole and when they speak French to me, my ear really has to become trained to understand what they're saying. So yeah, yeah it's not, I understand that. All right. So that's cool. You've got a lot of uh, travel and, and a lot more than most people would have, but what we're here to talk about a little bit about obstacles and challenges because you're, you're successful today and, Thanks. but it didn't come very easily. So talk to us about that. I know, so I don't even want to get it wrong. So I want to talk about, you were in music school. I sure was. You were in music school and one of the professors at the conservatory came to you and provided you with an opportunity. Yes. Okay. Take it from there. <laughs> yeah. So I actually had this horoscope book. I was in France and it was this horoscope book that said on this day, it was many months later, an unexpected opportunity will come your way that will change your life forever. And it was so noticeably different from any other day of my horoscope, which was just like good health today, you know, something bland <laughs> like that, that it was noticeable. So that day, uh, my friends were like, oh my gosh, it's the day, it's the day. And I went to the conservatory as I always did in the morning to practice and comes midday. Uh, and the director of the conservatory comes to me and he's like, hey, Geraldine, can you, can I see you in my office? And I'm like, oh no, what did I do wrong? Why? I don't know. I was a good kid, but I really got scared. Get in his office and he's like, you know, last year we had a competition uh, to see if one of our students uh, would qualify to go to Kalamazoo College in Kalamazoo, Michigan on a full scholarship for nine months. And we selected someone who decided not to go at the last minute. So this year we decided we are going to choose someone ourselves, no competition, somebody that we think would benefit from it and that would represent us well if they went. And we think that person is you. And the minute he said that I was gone, I knew it was mine. 
I knew it was mine. It was written in the stars. It was one of those faded moments and the horoscope was right. So there you go. Wow. <laughs> and how, how old were you? I was, tw- well, when he offered it to me, I might have been 19. Um, but yeah, I was 20 when I came to the U.S. To Kalamazoo College in Kalamazoo, Michigan. Cal- yes, Michigan. I'm a Michigander oh. at heart. It's my American hometown. So <laughs> right there, now you spoke French. Sure, yeah. You spoke, you know, Creole, but you were, you were French speaking. And I think I read something that kind of made me laugh out loud. I chuckled when you said, when you were on the plane, you know, you had the plane <laughs> ride and then you landed at the airport and then you were like, oh, wait, I think I'm going to need to speak English or something. I, it kind of made me laugh out loud. Yeah, I got the first hint. Well, so I thought I spoke English. My mother had mentioned at some point, she's like, what are you going to do in the US? You don't speak English. And I was like, well, how dare she? I've taken English (laughs) classes for years. Like, wow, like she's really like talking down at me. She never suggested I maybe take English classes. It never occurred to me I should because I thought I did. And the first inkling I had that maybe those classes had not paid off was actually in the plane when the waitress came and you know, the well, the waitress, the stewardess, you know, they speak in any language. They don't know what language you speak. So they'll randomly speak English or French. And she spoke to me in English, asking me if I wanted what sounded to me like, and I was like, (laughs) how am I supposed to pick which food I want if it sounds like that? And I was like, "Mm -hmm, what? And she went on to say, I was like, oh, I definitely do not understand this language, do I? And all she was trying to say was pasta or chicken. But uh, <laughs> but yeah, so I ended up with not the thing I wanted to eat that day, that's for sure. And then I landed and could not speak. You know, the person that came to pick me up probably said something like, hi, how are you? Which to me sounded like some more of the chicken and pasta dilemma. So yeah, yeah, I did not speak English, did I? <laughs> that's funny. Surprise! <laughs> Well, you know, school language, whether you speak French or English or, or any any language, what you learn in school is not what anybody speaks on the streets. It doesn't matter what language it is. Like, I don't know what it is. The Germans have it right. All the Germans speak English quite well, and they only learn it in school. So I don't know how what how is their education and curriculum like built, but well would be the answer to me. <laughs> wow, that's funny. Yeah. So- you had many roadblocks. We've already said that you've had, you've had a language barrier. Severe. <laughs> What's that? Severe and, and yes, language barrier. I could understand. I could imagine how fearful that would be because, like I mentioned, I've traveled many places, but I've never really had to know the language because I was going as a backpacker or a tourist or something. Like I wasn't going in for a job or a school. So that must have been a little bit terrifying. I mean, you had to make friends. You had to, you know, how yes. did that work out? Yeah, I mean, the the one kind of good thing, I mean, the school part was hard because I was used to getting a certain level of grades. And all of a sudden, I was like, I'm going to get lower grades because I don't speak the language. That doesn't seem fair. Uh, <laughs> but all my classes were about music. And that's when I truly understood why people say music is an international language. Because I could kind of understand the questions or kind of understand the answers or kind of work my way through simply because I spoke music. So in a way that really, really helped at the beginning. Now, we did, I did have a class where we had to watch the entirety of Ken Burns' documentary on jazz, which was probably like 14 hours. And I had to sit in this dark room and watch a TV where I understood absolutely nothing. In hindsight, maybe I should have asked for like the subtitled version, but this, keep in mind, this was before iPhones. This was before even laptops. People used to go to the computer center to do their homework. You know, this was before, I mean, maybe not DVDs. We had DVDs, but it was like, it wasn't as easy as like, you, you just click a button, you have subtitles, you click a thing and you have the translation of the word. It, there was none of that. So right. it was much harder than it would be now. Although now it would be probably harder to learn it quickly because you're so relying reliant on the devices where at the time I really just had to figure it out by myself at any given time. Right. They didn't have all these apps with Google Translate and stuff, right? Back yeah. Then. All you had then was miming. And I was, I've never been good at mime. So <laughs> <laughs> that's funny. Yeah. I mean, I, the first day I was like, I need a hair dry- I need a <laughs> for the hairdryer, you know, and I need a shh for the toothbrush. I mean, it was just sad. Oh, I didn't God. have anything. I didn't have a toothpaste. I didn't have a hairdryer. You know, I, why would I have those things? And you need to ask for those things. They're very specialized words. 
They are very specialized words. But everybody <laughs> brings a toothbrush with them when they travel. I what can I say? I was young and innocent. <laughs> Okay. I forgot I forgot all my socks really so I don't know what happened but I arrived and I was like I don't have socks and for some reason in my 20 year old brain I thought maybe my roommate stole my socks but no she didn't I found them at Christmas when I went home so I had to buy 20 pairs of socks and I went to Walmart could not find the area for socks the only thing I found that I arrived in September by the time I needed socks was October aka Halloween all I found were the Halloween socks. So all I had for my first year in the U.S. was Halloween socks. Oh my goodness, that's funny. <laughs> now, do they have Halloween? I know this may sound like an ignorant question, but do they have Halloween over in France? Not really. They kind of have been trying gently, but it's mostly like now bars will put a little like something, a ghost, and there's okay. some version, but it's not, it's not what, ha- like it's, if you like Halloween, don't go to France to celebrate Halloween, you know, if you really like it. If you don't care for it, okay, you'll, you'll see a little bit of it. So what did that, what did that, what happened to you when you were like, why are all these people walking around scaring the heck out of me with these costs? Did you think that or you already knew about it? I mean, we have movies. So, you okay. know, there's a lot of the American culture that comes, I think, all over the world pretty much. So, you know, we know things like... Uh, donuts and Chinese delivery food is a big thing that uh, we see on movies and you know when you move to New York City you know about the yellow cabs and you know about the big buildings so you know there's some of that we know about. I guess just lots of stuff we take for granted when you live in it. Yeah. Yeah and how did you how were friends did you were you able to make friends I mean you have a very outgoing personality so I can't imagine you not having any you know, imagine you having a hard time finding friends. You probably didn't. But with the language barrier, how did that work? Yeah, well, so we came, uh, Kalamazoo College is known for their international, pro- I sound like a, an advertisement now. So Kalamazoo College, <laughs> I, I am not paid. I haven't talked to them in years. But anyways, uh, I do owe them a lot. So they deserve <laughs> the ad if it is an ad. But they had a big international program. So most of their students in junior year would go abroad. Uh, and it was kind of an exchange program. They would go abroad to the places where we came from. And so we were a group of international students, maybe 30 of us. So we, there was a lot of things the college did for us. We'd have a welcome dinner. We'd have a weekly international students dinner. So we were very much a group. Uh, and we were all from different places. There was lots of people from different countries in Africa, lots of different countries in Europe, lots from South, uh, South America, Central America. So all of that. So we hung out together. Uh, there was not many French-speaking uh, students, but, you know, at least we we were just each other's companions. <laughs> yeah. And that's very, very important because then the homesickness would be even more, like, double. The homesickness was pretty rough. I'm pretty sure I cried every day the whole first trimester. I think every day I was like, I'm leaving tomorrow. And every day I was like, I'm leaving tomorrow. So it was always tomorrow, uh, but a pretty, yeah, I think it was pretty rough. <laughs> Absolutely. Definitely. Moving from a whole entire different world basically north america is like a whole different world yeah well and it's hard to imagine again today because we're so used to the the phone but there was no cell phone i mean there were cell phones but there was no iphones you couldn't make an international call like that it wasn't free there was skype maybe had just started but i didn't hear about it until six months later so all i had was I had to buy a calling card, which had like 30 numbers to put into a, a, a phone booth yeah. to call in. And it would take 10 tries before you connected to somebody. And it was, it was expensive. It was something like $10 for 10 minutes of conversation. So I would, you know, I was a student. So I had to pick every week one person I would call. So it was like one week is my mom, one week is my best friend, one week is my boyfriend. So it wasn't this thing where you have now where you're homesick, you just call, you just text, you just kind of connect it was like you're homesick you're homesick you're away from home and that's it yeah I remember I went to Spain and I was gonna call my mom I mean I had already lived on my own but my mom wanted me to keep in touch with her and I just gave up and I said you know what she'll have to understand like there's like a hundred numbers and nothing I so I get it I hear you with that one there was no such thing as any of this stuff so I don't even know if Skype existed when I went to Spain but that's what it is I mean this was 2003 and Skype might have just started but before it wasn't very well known let's put it that way so by the time someone mentioned it to me it was already the end of that first year and and it's hard to imagine because now I talk to my mom at least once a week I talk to my dad maybe twice a week we're always texting probably every day I mean I'm very much in touch with my family but yeah yeah not at that time not during that transition 
So that's hard too. You had to overcome that. You had to overcome homesickness, being away from those who understood you, not only in your language, but you as a whole. But you just mentioned that you had a boyfriend back home. How did yeah. that, like how was that having to leave your boyfriend? Oh, you know, I was 20. I don't think I felt like he was going to be the one. I don't <laughs> think I, you know, but it, it's funny because he, his mother had a, a friend who was a psychic. And one day he had told me, he was like, you know, uh, my mom just came to see her friend and they said, we're not going to be together because you're going to stay in the United States. You're not going to come back after nine months. And everyone in my life, when I left said, you're never coming back. And I was like, what do you mean? It's nine months. And they were all right. They were all right. Yeah. <laughs> yes. So you got into the conservatory, which is amazing. How Thank did you. that go? Like what, take me through, so nine months you did what you were supposed to do. What happened after the nine months? Why did you decide to stay? So right beforehand, before I came to the U.S., um, I wasn't in the conservatory in the U.S. I was at the at Kalamazoo College. But okay. before the U.S., when right. I was in the conservatory, I was finishing uh, my degrees and I was finishing everything. And I had to kind of make a choice of what I was going to do after. And the way France worked for music and what I knew at the time of it was that my options were either go to music university to become a music teacher and focus on theory and musicology, which didn't sound like that much fun. I wanted to play. And the other path was classical pianist, really high level, one of the two what we call superior conservatories. There's only two in France very competitive to get in. People from all over the world try to get in. There's age limits. I mean, it's ridiculous. And that's very classical. And I was like, well, that's not exactly what I care to do either. I don't want to be a solo classical pianist. I don't want to be in a chamber orchestra. I, I like songs and I like writing songs and I like singing and I like being with other people when I play and I like other types of music. So none of it felt like a fit for me, which is why when that opportunity to go to the US was came about, it felt so perfect because it gave me time to figure out what to do next. And what I realized once I was in the US was immediately I started playing for the voice uh, lessons. Immediately I started playing for the choirs, which I was already doing, but I also started being hired to do musical theater classes, to play for the musical theater productions. And me being in that environment was like, ah, this makes sense. Now this is fun for me. This is where what I want to do more of. And so by that point around you know January, when you have to send applications, my piano teacher, who was very much a mentor to me and took me under his wing, was like, well, you know, you could apply and you could do a master. I had no idea what a master was. We didn't have the equivalent of those degrees in France at that time. So I was like, I don't know what this is, but sure, why not? And so I applied and I got in. And it's only once I was at school and people were like, what year are you? And I was like, I'm doing a master. And I would see kids be like, wow, that's so cool. And I was like, what the heck is it that people are looking impressed about? And then I learned it, but... <laughs> I was so ignorant, wasn't it? Wasn't I? Amazing. So you decided to stay. You started doing, you know, your mentor, your professor, your teacher. But you got into Broadway. Like, that yeah. doesn't just happen. How did that happen? Yeah, well, many years went by. <laughs> many years of schooling. Many years of practice. You know, I didn't move to the city until I was 30. So I really, you know, worked as a professional musician for years and years and years before. I did a lot of musical theater before. Um, I put a lot of things in place before moving to the city. You know, I started, I had a blog, a music blog for a while, which helped and connected me with musicians. And through that music blog, I had become friends with someone who was in New York, who um, had created a group called Theater Music Directors, which is the, the job title of what I wanted to do. And he wanted to move on from that group because it was not active. It was just a couple hundred people. And he said, hey, can, do you want to take it over? Because we were doing things together. He was like, well, if you want to take it over, then uh, otherwise I'll just close it. So I took it over. And that really helped because then I became seen as this leader in the community. And people were used to seeing my name. So when I moved to the city, maybe two, three years later, I already had some kind of like leadership. Like I was kind of seen as a leader. I was organizing meetups. I was organizing classes in the field. I was hiring people that were way above me on the food chain. So it was really helping kind of making a, a foot in the door, at least to get jobs in the city and then slowly make my way to Broadway. Okay. So slowly means you had I believe been... in the long game. Yeah. Right. So that means you had been rejected by certain things that you would have applied for, right? Like if it, if it you always get rejected, you always get rejected as a musician. Yeah. I mean, as a, a, a because, of, and here's why, 
It's a very easy reason. It's not because you're a musician, you're rejected. It's because the way the job is. For somebody with a nine to five job, think of how often you're applying to a job. You know what? Once every few years, right? Once you're in a job, you stay there. When you're applying to job, how many times do you get rejected? A lot. Well, now the length of a musician's job is going to be maybe one day, maybe a month. Right. So you're redoing that process again and again. So it's not so much that you get rejected just because, uh, it's just because the job search process involves rejection and we just go through that process a lot more often. That's just what it is. And it's really not personal. No, it's it's rarely personal. Like, you know, they, they say starving artists, like whether you're a painter, you're a singer, you're a pianist, it doesn't matter. It's, it's rarely personal. It's just what the people out there are looking for. And I think- Go ahead. Sorry. No, go ahead. Well, I was going to say, and the pool is probably, there's a lot more competition because like you said, most people who have a nine to five, they're just doing their job. And, but there's a lot more competition of people looking for jobs. I mean, it's harder in the beginning of your career. You know, once you've been set in an area for a while, competition, yes and no, you're known, you're part of a community. Uh, you're called again. You don't have to do these things. It's a very different job in the first, you know, five, seven years of your career in one area. The area matters because every time you start in a new area, it's a new, you have to make a whole new circle. You start from scratch everywhere. But if you stay in your area, you know, the starving artist is quite a misconception. I mean, musicians make a fine living in the U.S., um, you know, paid, you know, they should be paid more in the sense that prices have not increased since I started working. So in 15 years, you're paid the exact same thing for the same jobs while the cost of living has increased. So in that sense, it should have gone up. That's true of most work uh, and most jobs in the United States. Uh, that's the case. But uh, most musicians make a living, work every day, are very busy. I mean, you know, if I had children and, and they wanted to date a musician, I would say, great, you're with a very hardworking, committed professional. Um, that, that's great. Who's going to bring in an income and that's going to be reliable unless they break their hand. <laughs> right. That's right. <laughs> That's awesome. So then, okay, so many years go by. What happened? How did you get on? Like, how did you get kinky boobs? I mean, that's, that's exciting. Yeah. Uh, you know, it's really hard to get on Broadway for one reason, which is there are no auditions. Oh, so that just makes it very difficult because you just have to know people. Now it is not to say, if you know the right person, you will get the job. If you know the right person and on the right people and you do not have the skills, you will absolutely not get hired. It is a very much high level job. You have to do it right. There's a right way and a wrong way. Uh, and there's a, a level that needs to be met. And that's just that. But if you have the level, you know nobody, you're not going to be hired. And if you know people and you're not good, you're not going to be hired. But if you know people and you are at the level, people will put you at first on lower level gigs when you start, when you're new in a city and you're like, I'm looking to do this thing. Nobody pretty much will go from, I just moved to the city. Oh, I just got this like full-time job on Broadway. Usually people on Broadway will start knowing your name. You'll meet them, you'll interact with them. And they'll be like, okay, well, can you do this two hours rehearsal this one day? They're going to put you on low level stakes. So if you really mess it up, it's not great, but they'll know not to call you again. So now you're going to do well. Maybe if you exceed expectations on top of that, they're going to hear a return like, oh my gosh, this person was amazing. At best, they're going to hear nothing, which is good. And at worst, they're going to hear, please never send me this person again. And that's that. Will, and that happens. I've had, I've, I have somebody I recommended that I've heard that about. And it's like, I can never recommend this person again. Yeah. Um, but yeah, and then they'll be like, okay, well, now I can maybe get you for this other thing. Now that's a week long. So now you see, how are you on a week? Like, when it's every day, there's maybe more stakes. Okay, well, now you can do this other thing. So it's very much like building blocks. And it's helpful, I think, for everyone. Because it helps you also know that you are the level at every step and keep working, meet more people. So by the time you, you, you get on Broadway, it's very much something that you feel makes sense also. It's still scary. It's still a big opportunity. Uh, it's still something you take very seriously. But it, you, you don't have this thing of like, I go from nowhere to this thing. And now I'm thrown into the walls, you know. Right, right. So how do you, how did you decide you wanted to be on a conductor? Because that's a skill in itself. That's not playing a piano. That's like, you're in charge of the entire orchestra, basically. Yeah. Yeah, I think it's something that, well, first of all, I've always been a natural leader, which I think is inherent. So I think even as a little child, I was the one organizing the games with my friends. I was the one 
you know, telling the school, why don't we do this? How about we do that? So I just had this natural, like, let's get people together. Let's do this project, things like that. So that's one thing. And then the second thing is even when I started working at, you know, 16 and friends as a pianist, I was hired to do the, to play for the choirs. Sometimes you end up teaching the choirs and that's already kind of conducting. You're still playing, but you're leading a large group of people telling them what to do, how to do it, when to do it. So a lot of the job is already there. Then I took my first conducting class that first or second trimester at Calum Music College. And I remember the first day of class, the wonderful teacher who was also the concert master of the Calum Music Symphony was this lovely older gentleman that I loved. And he said, you're an excellent pianist. You're a great singer, but above all, you're meant to be a conductor. And that never left me because nobody had ever said that. And that, that trimester, I was able to lead uh, my first concert as a conductor, stick conducting. Um, and that just felt so right and so good. I'm very comfortable in that position. And, and then when you work in musical theater and you're a pianist, it tends to, you are often offered jobs that are music director. And when you're a music director, you're teaching all the actors the, the music, which in a lot of it is going to be choir. So again, you're having large ensembles, you're playing the piano at the same time. So you are leading, you're conducting. Because conducting is not just waving your arms. You're conducting if you're the one people look at to set the tempo, to set the dynamics and the volumes, to set the style. It's not the waving of the arms so much. Um, so when you're going to conduct from the piano, you're going to wave your head, you're going to wave you know, your chin is conducting, your body movement is going to do it. One way to do it is with arms, but your body is your instrument, really. Absolutely. Um, and so, yeah, I took that class and then I did it with, with musical theater, which is part of the job of a music director. Um, so, yeah, it's just been years and years. That's amazing. I love it. What it's a your, thrill. Yeah. And then to all the people come in and just the energy of the crowd that comes in to watch whatever project you're working on, whatever musical you're working on, enjoying it and getting into it. Like that must just, that must be such a thrill. Yeah. I mean, when you're a musician and you're playing in the pit, you don't really feel it quite as much because you don't really see them. You hear them if they laugh, you can kind of sense that, but you're more hanging out with your colleagues, which is super fun and wonderful. When you're a conductor, depending on your placement, because in musical theater as a conductor, you can be put uh, backstage, you can be put in another room, and then you, everything is going through cameras and, and, and screens. But if you're in the traditional sense, like Kinky Boot was like in front of the stage, like we say the conductor has the best seat in the house because you're genuinely before the front row in the dead center of the stage. And you just look up and all the actors are right there. And usually they'll have their inside jokes with you. They'll look at you and wink at you at the moment where nobody else is looking at them. And that's just so fun. And when you're in that position, the first row is right behind you. So people usually will like tap on your shoulder, be like, you look like you're having fun. Or like, they'll be like, oh, you're so good. How, how long have you been doing it? Or in my case, it's so nice to see a woman doing this. You're the first woman I've seen in this job. So that, that's always fun. I was going to mention that later, but we might as well now. Um, <laughs> doing the, in the position that you're in now, I'm sure nowadays there's more, but it is typically a man's role. So for you to have that, that's also another accomplishment. Another, it seems, and I might get this wrong, it seems a lot of the obstacles that most people, not that you haven't, because you've had a lot of obstacles, but that most people would have to endure. Maybe it's because of your innate leadership skills and your personality, you were able to kind of just like not get stuck in those, in those pits that some people tend to. And as a woman, like I said, that was typically not a woman's role. And, and look at you. Yeah, I've been really big into the internalized misogyny lately. And so something now that I'm noticing that I wouldn't have before is, for example, when you say it's, a, it's, a, it's been a man's role. And now I'm like, no, it's been a role given to men. It is a role and, and it's interesting, right? Cause now we're like realizing all these things, but um, yeah, there's a lot of efforts currently being done in, on Broadway to include a lot more women as musicians, but also have a lot, there's a lot of conversations currently about trans right, LGBTQ, um, you know, having more races uh, portrayed on stage. So there's a lot going on at the moment and for the past few years on those topics, including women in the pits and uh, leadership roles in particular, because there's been more women in pits but not as many making it to the higher ranks as always. So it's like, well, yes, now there's many of us at a high level playing, but now are we all making it to the top positions? Not necessarily. Right. So, yeah. So what, is, what have you learned? And this is a broad question, I know, but what have you learned along the way? Like 
you must have, I know there's a book. We're going to talk about your book. I mean, you have two poetry books that you've published. Yeah. Um, one just came out two days ago. It came out two days ago. Yeah. One oh, of them. Yeah. The wow, second that's one. Awesome. So Thank you. we'll talk about those in, in a second, but I just Yay. want to get to, you said something. I want to ask a question and I want to get it right. Um, so I, I heard you say something in your opinion, there was a difference between success and oh my gosh, what did you say? Self-realization, I think you said. Mm -hmm. Can you, so your opinion, there's a difference. Tell me about it. Yeah, actually the first time I came across this concept was when I, the, probably the day I graduated with my master's degree from Western Michigan University. And I bought this book called The Happiness Trap. And it's not a very, not as famous a self-help book as many others, although it has a certain following. Uh, it's a wonderful book. And it was really the first time I came across the idea that success is not, and we've heard this before, but success is not what other people define as success. And the right. day I was reading that, I was graduating with my master's and I cried. And why did I cry? Because I was supposed to go do another master's the following year in a different town in one year because I had enough uh, equivalencies. And I was crying because I was happy where I was and I didn't want to leave. And when I read this book, I was like, oh, a second master's degree seems very successful. But for me, in my heart, what success is actually is working and staying in this town. And that was the first time where I saw the difference of that, that it can seem successful doesn't mean it is. It, it only is successful if you're realizing what success is for you or not even success with where your calling is, which at times might not have anything to do with success. It might just be as simple as like, I'm taking some time off and going on vacation or taking time off in a retreat or what, you know, going with a Habitat for Humanity and volunteering. It may have nothing to do with professional, like a professional career or success, quote unquote, but it's actually your soul yearning. If you follow that, eventually it can take you to places that feel way more successful than the traditional success path. I, I love that because like you said, traditional success is how much money do you make? How many things do you own? You know, that's how some people, a lot of people, too many people value their success is what they have in, in, you know, things are things they can be taken away in an instant, you know, but it's what's internal. You said something like, if you don't feel like success, then are you really successful? And that was, that's, it's quite deep. That's, that's one of those things that make you go, huh? Cause you can have it all and still be lacking inside. Right. So success comes from within. And I love that. And I love that you say that. And I love that people listening and watching right now, it's important to know that just because things aren't going exactly how you planned, or you have obstacles to overcome, maybe you don't speak the language, maybe there's cultural differences, but success, that doesn't determine your success. And you are a perfect example of how to overcome those obstacles and pursue your, your dreams, your visions, your goals. And that in itself is success. And I, yeah, and the, I, sorry, go ahead. No, go ahead. No. And the other thing that's interesting is that we tend to think success and goals are intertwined, but no, actually, because it's known that a lot of times when you're going to reach a big goal, which eventually will lead you to feel successful, but a lot of time reaching a big goal will be followed immediately by a letdown <laughs> inside of you, not from the outside world, not life will now throw you a curveball. But a lot of times you'll feel a little bit empty for a while. And that's very common and very unexpected and can left, leave people feeling very confused. And like, but I just reached this like goal I had that's big goal. And now why do I feel so bad about myself? And that's pretty common. And it can take a week to a month, a lot of times. And after that, now you're adjusting and there's a lot of changes that come with achieving a big goal. You have to kind of readjust your perception of yourself. And it's not because it's positive that it's easy and quick and done in an instant. Um, and so, yeah, the success is more of like the quality of your life over time, rather than these moments of success that eventually can cause you to feel good actually about yourself, but it's in time. It's not instantaneous. That's right. That's almost like it's not the destination. It's the journey that matters. It's who you become in the journey toward your goal. It's who is that person becoming by doing all the things that the goal requires. That's beautiful. I love that. I think yeah. all those things all the time. <laughs> I mean, it seems so simple sometimes, right? Like when you hear it, you're like, well, yeah, but we don't tend to live like that. We tend to what society tells us is success and how to strive. And that stresses us out. And that 
you know, does make us feel like bad inside because, okay, well, I've reached this goal, but I'm not where this person or these industries say I should be yet. But you've just accomplished something. So, you know, celebrate that. I think some, something that's very helpful is when you're traveling or when you are somewhere where nobody knows you, which I highly recommend everyone be in those situations at time, be without a partner, without anybody, go somewhere where nobody knows you. How do you feel when people interact with you and they don't know what you've done, when they don't know what are what other people consider your success? And are you uncomfortable that people don't know that about you? Mm -hmm. And if so, why is that? And are you able to just be with people and never share those things? And for me, there are many times every time I travel, nobody knows I'm a published author. Nobody knows I've been on Broadway. They just know my name is Geraldine. And, and it's, I find it very freeing personally, because it's like, I know these people are hanging with me because they just want to hang. They could not care less if I'm an accountant, an accountant, or <laughs> depending on what kind of accountant I am, a TikTok accountant or a real life accountant, <laughs> um, or if I'm a musician, or if I'm, you know, jobless, or if I'm a student, they could not care less. And there's that to me is success. Because if now your base is, you're basing all of your relationship upon other people seeing you a certain way then you don't feel successful, right. you know? Because yeah. now it's all about how people view you. But if they just enjoy your presence, that's success right there. That's right. I love that. Thank you. Thank you for that. Yeah. So let's talk about the books now. So you're Yay, a published books. author. Yeah. <laughs> Thank two you. Books. You just, uh, it just came out, you said two days ago. Which one was that? So the, the, the poetry I have is a three-part series. The first book, Naked, came out April 6th of this year. And the second book is the one that just came out called Power. And the third book will be coming out sometime in the next few months. Uh, and it will complete the series, which the series is called Truth. And they're all available on Amazon, paperback, ebook. Mm. And they're both already went number one. Nice. Naked was number one in eight categories. American poetry, women's poetry, inspirational poetry, uh, and many others I have not uh, memorized. <laughs> and... Uh, and yes, Power just hit number one last night. So in eight categories, it was number one? Uh, naked, yes. Wow, that's amazing. Yeah, it's different it's categories for each book, but but Power did hit the number one status yesterday. So that was very exciting. That is very exciting. And Thank then you. Truth comes out soon. Yes, I'm working on it. <laughs> that's awesome. So we have Naked, Power, Truth, the books of poetry, Geraldine yes. Anello. Yeah. Right. So go on and get it. That's yes. exciting. But I want to so talk. Excited. I mean, and I, I, I love that. I want to talk, but I want to talk about your other book that's coming out in the fall. Yes. The Insider's to Guide to the Music Industry. Sorry, say that again. The Insider's Guide to the Music Industry. Right. So, I mean, I, I'm not taking away from your poetry books because I'm going to go out and probably, I love that. So I'm probably going to go out and get all three when the last one comes out. But this one, I'm definitely, I told you before when we were speaking, before we uh, started this, I, I'm definitely absolutely getting this book because you don't have to be a musician to get this book. So I don't want people to think that right off the bat, I don't want them to think you have to be a musician. This is, it is a book for that, but explain it to us a little bit, please, so I don't get it wrong. Yeah, it's a book that really gives all the answers as far as what it's like to work in the music industry in different paths. You know, what is it like to work as a classical musician in an orchestra or to go on tour with Blake Shelton or to work in L.A. In, as one of the top studio musicians playing for, you know, the Hollywood movies and all the advertisements and the TV shows? What is it like to work, um, you know, on a TV set like, uh, you know, the, the late night shows? All those ways you can be a musician or on Broadway, obviously. Uh, what is it like to work as those people? And so I talk to all the top level people across the different genres of music and uh, different instruments. And you really get to the heart of what it is to be a musician and the different paths available as a musician. And so for the geeks out there who enjoy just knowing the backstage, it's really fun. Like I love knowing backstage of, of any jobs, like restaurant jobs, hotel jobs, yacht. You know, I watch all the reality TV shows that show people <laughs> backstage. And so this does that, you know, it's the reality TV show version of backstage of music. <laughs> I love it. I love it. But what I love too is, you know, you had many, many, many no's. Yes. <laughs> you know, you, they didn't, 
they didn't feel like this is where they wanted to go to publish this book with you. Tell us about that a little bit, some of those obstacles. Yeah, when I first created it, it also was a different format, but at first people said no for it. So someone who said no suggested putting it as an interview book, which uh, that show goes to show that receiving no's can be blessings in disguise. So then I followed that advice, did send it to over 100 publishers that said no, but many of them do give feedback, which is helpful. And they all had one feedback, which was it's a fantastic book, it's just too niche for us to produce it. So it was great because it said I had that validation as far as the level of the book itself. And also just the fact that it was a choice of publication. They didn't want to take the financial risk. Um, so, you know, it was, it, it, you know, in a way it was no, but in a way it was yes. <laughs> but you had a lot of no's first. You had like a hundred. Over a hundred. I'm very, you know, I'm so used to it. When I moved to the city, I applied to a hundred choirs that did not have job posting. I just wrote a hundred of them and said, I need a job. And to me, you know, people will see the 96 that didn't respond. All I saw was like, wow, look, I had four that responded. One gave my name to, some, to someone else. Uh, somebody else hired me. Somebody else asked one of my friends if I was good, said yes. Now, to this day, I work for this space, like eight years later. So I'm like, all I had was eight years worth of good, well-paid music work because of these hundred emails that took me one afternoon. That's a great great turnaround you know that's what i see i don't see the 96 that didn't respond i'm like well they missed it they were busy they didn't need anybody so i do that all the time i think quantity is somebody people don't think about like quantity or, or if you email 100 you're, you're going to forget who you wrote to you're just going to yeah. see people all of a sudden a month later that say hey we need a pianist are you available and you're like oh, score and you forget that it was thanks to you you just think now people wrote you out of the blue you know <laughs> <laughs> but i mean that is another part of your personality, which <laughs> is probably why you succeed in almost everything you touch, because a hundred no's would really be discouraging for a lot of people. And, and they just would give up after probably, you know, maybe 20 or 50. So mm. that you're just like, well, I got four responses. Like you see the positive and you That's because they don't write enough. If you're waiting for an answer, you didn't write enough people. You should have written so many people that you don't even know who you're, that by the time you get an answer, you don't know who they are and what it's for. You're like, who are you? Did I write you? Did you write me? Did you, you know? Yeah. yeah. I think it's a numbers game. I really do. And I love the way you think that. And that's why I'm hoping that people listening and watching this can take that away. That these things will come. These obstacles will come. It's just life. Don't give up. Like, think of it like Geraldine thinks of it. Oh, well, so that's just not where I was meant to be. And you forget sometimes because you've messed, you've applied so many times to different things that when the four do come in that say, yes, it's a success. It's, you know, so I'm hoping people can take that away from you because I think it's extremely important. It's a life lesson, not just in your job or your, it's in everything we do. It's like, what is the marker? Is the marker how many no's you got or is the marker I wanted this thing and I got it? Right. So if the marker is no, you're not going to have the thing you want because now you were like, well, they said no. But if the marker is I'm getting the thing I want, you're going to do everything. So if it's a hundred no's and then you get the thing you want, that, that was a success. That was not a no. That was now a yes because you got the thing you wanted. That's right. That's right. See, that's why you needed to be on this show to teach us these things. <laughs> I'm so happy I'm here and I'm loving <laughs> that background with all the flowers. It makes me oh, so happy. <laughs> thanks. <laughs> so I want, when this, when does this book come out? It, this fall 2021 okay now i'm digressing here and i apologize but it just came to me because i'm looking yes. at the background there but i want to know i mean people are like oh kim you're going all over the place but i want to know why are you in mexico now i mean why not uh but the main reason is because when covid happened uh i like all musicians completely lost an entire year's worth of work pretty much in one instant mm -hmm. And so thankfully, I was very lucky in that I had been reading for a couple of years that we were due for an economic crisis. So I had been really doubling down on my savings uh, purposefully to prepare for such an event. And so when COVID happened, I was like, ha, oh, lucky, I prepped for this. So, um, so then I was like, well, if I'm going to live out of my savings, I can live in New York City, which is very expensive. Or how about I find a cheaper place? And so I did spend the first three months in New York uh, by myself in my apartment, saw nobody. Um, after that, I went to my family and friends, but after a few months, it was clear that I needed to live by myself again, that I needed my own life back. And, um, I looked around Mexico was open and it was a cheaper place to be in. I could just go further with my savings. Cause when I came here in October, it wasn't clear how long 
you know, things were going to be closed, when they were going to reopen. And I came here because I had gone to Tulum for three days, three years ago. It was empty. The beaches looked awful. And I was like, that's fine. At least the weather will be nice. I'll do confinement in Tulum. Showed up in Tulum with a ticket about two days before. And what did I find? Everybody was out there. Everybody was hanging out. All the places were open. It was packed. And I was like, what happened? <laughs> I was at the bed. The beaches were beautiful because it turned out I had gone in a season when there's a lot of sargassum on the beach. And I was like, what are these beaches? Where am I? Is this heaven? It was like, wait, everybody comes to Tulum for this. And I was like, well, I did not think that's what I was heading into. And then after Tulum, I realized Tulum was not really for me. So then I came to Playa del Carmen, which is very much more my speed. It's been great. I've been learning Spanish, lots of entrepreneurs here. So I've, you know, been having lots of good conversations and stretching my savings. So that's awesome. That's why. That's beautiful. Free spirit. I love it. <laughs> I love you. it. So what's next for Jared, Geraldine and Nella? Yeah. What is next? <laughs> Yeah, my dad calls them the adventures of Geraldine. Geraldine in Mexico. Geraldine published yeah. a book. Geraldine, <laughs> he's like, it's like those book series. What's next is uh, my third book, Truth, coming out very soon. The, the other book, the industry music book, is next. And also, I am a community builder. And so I built a community a year and a half ago called Handy Women. It is uh, for women who do handy work. And we empower women with tools. And this community has grown in a year and a half tremendously, which is past 38,000 members. Wow. We're launching local groups, uh, Northeast, Northwest, so that local handy women can connect with each other. It's very much uh, a lot of what I'm spending my time doing. We're going to start offering classes for women by women. Uh, in a safe space it's a very safe and welcoming place so if you want to join handy women come on along but that's where i spend a lot of my time is building that community and i feel so passionate for that mission it's a way for me to be a feminist in a very kind way we're, we're working for women with women we're not bashing anybody so that's that's something that feels very uh, mission driven for me i love it i love it i love Thank you. your spirit i love your personality Thank you. and i just love people that you can communicate with and feel so free and open and like we've known each other forever almost you know I love that yes. personality so it's kind of like me too my my daughter's always like do you make friends wherever you go I'm like yes ah. like in the grocery I can't even go to the grocery store without like laughing my head off with somebody that I just met like oh I love that your kind of personality I feel like it's just inviting so thank I love you for that. that thank you thank you and thanks for having me this has been so fun I, I'm thankful for you and I want my listeners to please go out and check out her, her books of poetry. We have Naked by Geraldine Anello. We have Truth. Well, Truth is coming out. So we have Power, Power. which is out and then Truth coming out soon. And then the book for uh, the industries. Is it still um, unplugged and unfiltered with A-list musicians? No, no, the title, we're still working on it. Okay. But it is an insider's guide to the music industry. That's probably the secondary title. Yeah. I forget what you call that. <laughs> yeah. I love that. And I'm going to have some of the information on um, on the YouTube station. That's why we're filming. So your all your information will be on as we're talking so that they can get all of this and where to go and your website and how to find you and hear you and awesome. support you in whatever you're doing. Thank you and so much for that. Thank you. And I, I do. I wish you the best. And I hope we can stay in contact somehow. I know you know, people say that let's stay in touch and you really do mean it and nothing ever comes of it. You know, if, I if, love staying in touch with people. I do yeah. it a lot. Me too. So if we do, I'm we do, sure you I do. do. <laughs> I hope we do. So Geraldine, thank you so much once again, um, for helping us learn that obstacles are not, are not pits. It's just an opportunity for more success. Yes, it is. That was beautifully said. Thank you. I just came up with that on the spot. <laughs> Namaste. <laughs> so thank you. And thank my you. listeners, thank you once again. Thank you. I appreciate you every week for tuning in. Thank you. Make sure, like I always say, you share, subscribe, tweet, like, I don't know, send a pigeon. Tell everyone they should be listening to This Is Your City. Stay safe. Stay blessed. Ciao.